February 2003, a doctor from mainland China arrived in Hong Kong and checked into the Kowloon Metropolis Hotel. He had come to Hong Kong to attend a family member's wedding, but what he wasn't aware of was that he was sick and carrying a novel virus. The day after he checked into the hotel, he felt worse and went to the hospital. By then, the virus had already quietly spread. This is believed to be the source of the SARS epidemic that swept through Hong Kong in 2003. SARS, also known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, is a viral respiratory disease of zoonotic origin caused by Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. At the time, people had no idea that their lives would be changed by this new virus and that Hong Kong society would be affected by it in the long term. In the Legislative Council report on February 26th of 2003, the government stated that no unusual disease patterns associated with influenza and respiratory infections were detected in reports from public and private hospitals. Therefore, when the first SARS cases emerged in Hong Kong in 2003, everything seemed to be under control. The authorities downplayed the dangers of SARS, which led a lot of people to believe that they had nothing to fear. It seemed that the few reported cases were under control. However, the public's perception changed when a Hong Kong doctor held a press conference. Being a healthcare worker, he experienced firsthand that the virus was much more dangerous than previously communicated and also that it had, contrary to popular belief, already spread to the community. He revealed this to the press, leading to a lot of media coverage as well as criticism of the government's handling of the outbreak. After that, the government's attitude towards SARS changed. Health authorities implemented several measures to combat the spread of the virus. Classes were suspended in schools and universities, and all incoming residents and visitors were required to make health declarations. After a famous radio host recommended the use of face masks, officials also began to publicize through TV news and other media, advising people to wear masks. I think it was 2003, right? Yes, it was. I think I was just stopped my secondary one, sorry. I was a 401 student. Actually, I was living in Amon Garden. I was living in Port F of Amo Garden, so I mean, maybe you guys have heard about that. I mean, that period of time I was quite scary, to be honest. But I'm, well, I'm not say I'm very scary, you know, I'm because I was too young at the moment. Yes. But the only thing I remember is because I don't have to go back to school for few months, for two to three months. My school sent me the question how you her homework. And then we just finished our homework at home. Well, that was my first time to wear a mask. Amoy Garden was a hard-hit area during the SARS crisis in Hong Kong. From the end of March to April 15th, there were 321 cases of SARS reported here, especially in the worst-hit Block E, where the cases accounted for 41% of the total. What really makes me worry about that is the day that the government is sent to for anti-pandemic personnel. They come to the Amoy Garden and they ask all the residents uh, but now this quarantine camp is very common. It's not a big deal going to a quarantine camp. But that, for that 2003, this totally was a totally new, new idea for, for, for Hong Kong and for Hong Kong people. We, don't, we didn't have much experience on that. They come to the Amy Garden and they bring the, and they ask all the residents leave their household and um, take them to the mini bus and they send them to the quarantine For me, it's very impressive and then for kind of good experience. But to be honest, I don't really, I didn't feel very scared. In the public library, they still like open, like ball, like field Harry Potter books. I, I think spent much more time reading Harry Potter. I've been starting in March, and then in June or July, some of this sounds, seems a virus, certainly a piece of paper. For many people in Hong Kong, memories of 20 years ago may be fading, but students will remember the days when they didn't have to go to school and adults will remember how masks became popular. Medical workers or medical communities were the particular group who were more affected by SARS than the general population. They treated and saved SARS patients at the risk of infection and many medical and nursing students who were still in school joined the battle in the hospitals out of necessity. Sociologist Peter Baer described the social language that was prevalent in Hong Kong during SARS, where the disease was portrayed as a war with healthcare workers seen as heroes and fighters. 
we had most of our praise on those who fight against the SARS on the front, like the doctors, the nurse, right? We have the Michelle Jie, right? Uh, the famous nurse who died uh, during the, the SARS. And then we have, of course, Joseph Song, you know, our BC, also fight against the SARS on the front, you know, at, uh, I think, at Prince Wells Hospital, right? Uh, in Chantit. We, we had most of our praise on those uh, social figures, but perhaps governments might not be fortunate to share. Still, partly, as I said, the confidence issue that uh, it was suffering during the time. So, frankly, uh, my sister is a nurse. I think she was a student nurse during that time. She did not have much top experience about the SARS, but I know that uh, the, the nurse community during that time really had a lot of time. The Hong Kong SARS Memorial Garden is located in Hong Kong Park in the Central District and was inaugurated in 2005. It was built to pay respects to eight frontline healthcare workers who lost their lives after treating patients with SARS. Hong Kongers remembered these medics as brave and they honored their sacrifice. Some of them passed away very young, in their 30s. Unlike in 2020 when COVID started and we got necessary updates from social media, during SARS, television news and newspaper reports were the only way to keep up to date with the developments. Well, this totally different world. We don't have smartphones in our life. We, don't, yeah, we just have like television. Uh, even the internet is not most not that common. So the main source of information was TV, TV news. And I was too, too young. I was too young. I mean, the two people of this are asking me, like, can I identify is a fake news or real so or is a credible source of news or information to be honest? I don't know. I don't think I have uh, such capacity to do that at that time. Mm -hmm. But the main source of it will be newspaper and uh, TV. To a certain extent, we feel some kind of, I would not say discrimination, but mm -hmm. people are really scared about, about sharing the food if you know you're living in a government. I don't think they intended to discriminate against you. I think it's a very normal reaction. It's very normal emotional expression. It's always something uncertain, something that they don't know about. So because the Bible was so new, and what's what's that? Was that new? It's very that new. I mean, compared with the old one. Limited access to information made people more dependent on the authorities. The reports the Hong Kong government released possibly failed to make people fully aware of the seriousness of SARS. However, there were other local and international media reporting on the SARS outbreak. They monitored the honesty of authorities and provided emotional stories and rational statistical facts. The reports prompted the Hong Kong government to take more scientific and strict measures. Stories like how Tse Yuan Man volunteered to treat SARS patients and died honorably encouraged people in Hong Kong not to give up and keep fighting SARS. The outbreak was gradually brought under control after a few months, but the impact of SARS on society has not completely disappeared. One of the long-term effects of SARS in Hong Kong was a change in public and personal hygiene awareness. After SARS, we have, uh, I mean, the people in Hong Kong, they're much, I mean, most of us really have a uh, much better personal hygiene conditions. But the problem is people forget, because we don't have a major pandemic, for like two decades, and then sometimes people forget. They forget to wash their hands properly, and then they don't wear masks anymore. But I do think that the SARS really change the cultures because before SARS, I think we feel fear about wearing masks because we don't have to have this conferences. But after SARS, I think it's okay. It's comfort for people wear masks. And understand that wearing masks is a very effective measure to stop the spread of the, the virus. I think one one great thing is that our health awareness has been greatly elevated since the SARS. We, for example, uh, wash our hands much more frequently, and sometimes we feel sick, we wear a mask. I just couldn't imagine this before the SARS. So our, our, our habits really changed. Many of our habits really changed. The SARS epidemic taught the public how to deal with diseases and practices like hand washing and wearing a mask when sick became part of the way of life. It also aroused public attention to environmental pollution issues and public health care. 
Sanitary and medical conditions for infectious diseases in Hong Kong have improved a lot. The Center for Health Protection and other departments were set up within the government to coordinate the work of dealing with infectious diseases, and many additional isolation facilities were built in hospitals. Another lasting effect of SARS was that it left Hong Kong residents with a sense of pride in their community. Hong Kongers faced the parting of relatives and friends, and some were disappointed with the epidemic response. But in the end, they overcame these difficulties and worked together to eliminate SARS and rebuild Hong Kong's international reputation. They felt greater solidarity among community members and the true value of Hong Kong. Thanks to the efforts of healthcare workers, government officials, the media and the community, people gradually returned to their normal lives after several months. Students were back in class and masks were no longer necessary for people to travel. The memories and experiences left by SARS, however, are long-lasting. The Hong Kong Museum of Medicine Science collects and preserves artifacts related to the development of medicine in Hong Kong, including photographs of the SARS outbreak and displays of related information. In 2019, an art exhibition called Contagious Cities, Far Away, Too Close, presented by the Wellcome Foundation and jointly organized by Tycoon, also focuses on the SARS outbreak. Ten artists use contemporary artworks to show their thoughts on the epidemic from different perspectives. Today, the world faces another big pandemic. Nearly three years into the COVID-19 pandemic, masks are once again on people's faces. Hong Kong's community and officials can build on the experience with SARS in 2003 to face today's struggle. We don't know when this pandemic will end, but what is certain is that it has become another great human crisis in history that will change people's lives and society in general.